Yes. Our next speaker is uh, Abdel Fattah Saoud, Obad Saoud. Um, he is going to uh, address uh, minimally invasive sacral and sacroiliac fixation. Obad is a uh, prior president of this society, has been the chair of uh, orthopedic surgery at Ain Shams University in Cairo. Uh, has been the um, vice president, has been the dean there, and now is a second in command at the entire institution as vice president for education and student affairs in charge of 100,000 students. Um, he again is going to address minimally invasive sacral and sacroiliac fixation. Take it away, Obad. Thank you, sir. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, uh, it's, uh, it's an honor for me to be introduced uh, by my mentor. So you are the mentor of a lot of, uh, of people, but uh, you have a very special place in, uh, in our hearts. Uh, I will talk today about uh, the, the many, many invasive uh, fixation of uh, sacral fractures. Uh, sacral fractures can be classified uh, according to Dennis or Denis. Uh, into three zones. Uh, zone one, uh, where the fracture uh, involves the uh, sacral ala, lateral to the foraminal. Uh, zone two uh, is the transforaminal longitudinal fractures. And zone three is medial to uh, uh, the, um, the uh, sacral foramini, uh, so it passes uh, through the spinal canal. Uh, and because this zone three is dangerous, it's, uh, it's passing uh, through the spinal canal. Um, it is subclassified into um, four other types according to the fragmentation of the uh, affected segment and the displacement as well. Uh, especially that uh, most of, uh, of these fractures are having a transverse limb, making them uh, H or U-shaped um, uh, in most of the instances. Uh, this is another important classification uh, uh, that is devised um, for transforaminal um, uh, sacral fractures that are very common. Uh, if we talk about sacral fractures, they are either completely lateral uh, to the uh, lumbopelvic articulation or passing partially um, uh, medial to that articulation, or completely going um, through uh, this articulation. Uh, the type 2 and type 3 are having some kind of lumbopelvic dissociation, especially if it is bilateral. Uh, and this is uh, important in management, as I'm going to talk about uh, in a few minutes. Uh, the other consideration dealing with uh, sacral fractures is um, uh, the, the soft tissue compromise. Most of these patients uh, are having uh, skin that, uh, and soft tissue that is affected like that. It's high energy trauma. Uh, most of the skin is degloved uh, and having subcutaneous hematoma. We have to put this in consideration, and this puts a very uh, special emphasis uh, on the uh, use of uh, minimally invasive methods uh, of fixation around this area. The indications of surgical treatment of sacral fractures are usually expanding retroperitoneal hematoma. And usually uh, dealing with that fracture is a, is a life-saving um, uh, thing because uh, uh, fixation uh, of those fractures um, uh, would cause tamponade of the expanding retroperitoneal hematoma and it saves patient's life. Um, more than one centimeter displacement or if there is displacement or persistent pain during conservative management, Soft tissue compromise is, um, uh, is always there, and it's an indication for fixation because the more stability of the fracture you get, uh, the more um, uh, chance for the soft tissue to heal. Also, neurological compromise, which is usually a bladder or bowel uh, disturbance, uh, L5 and, uh, and sacral uh, motor weakness is always uh, there or sometimes there. And surgery comprises of both uh, decompression and stabilization. And to uh, talk about decompression, it seems that on long term, uh, there's no big difference uh, uh, on the results of um, direct or indirect decompression. So uh, my special bias is to do um, direct decompression in incomplete neurology to give um, the best chance for this patient to, uh, to recover. And in type one and type three, and for type two, which is uh, the transforaminal, I tend to do indirect uh, methods of, um, uh, of um, decompression in the form of good reduction of the fracture. Um, and then for stabilization, there are two biomechanical concepts that has to be put in mind for everyone who's going to try uh, fixing a fracture around this area. Uh, the lumbosacral pivot point, uh, McCord point, uh, described in 1992, it's the axis of flexion and extension 
at the lumbosacral junction lies uh, in the back of L5-S1 disc. And for constructs that cross the lumbosacral junction, only those devices that pass at least partially ventral uh, to this point provide a significant um, uh, biomechanical advantage regarding the rigidity of fixation. This is the point. And although this McCord point is uh, devised for um, uh, lumbopelvic fixation mostly, but uh, uh, during our work that I'm going to talk about uh, in a few minutes, um, uh, we felt that it applies also to fixation of the sacrum and the sacroiliac dislocations. As the more you go anterior in, uh, in uh, trying to fix around this area, the more you embrace the whole um, uh, pelvis, both hemipelvis, and um, uh, maybe uh, these are the sacral bars that the orthopedic um, uh, surgeons are aware of. They were used uh, years ago and they failed and it seems now that this happened because they passed completely behind the McCoyd point. The other consideration is the fixation zones, the blue area, which is the S1 vertebral body and the infinite margins of the sacral ala, and also the, um, uh, the both iliac bones uh, are zone one and three of fixation, and they, these are strong areas for fixation, but try to avoid the green area, which is the inferior margin of the sacral ala, S2, and the area till the tip of the toxics because it's least effective poor bone stock with anatomical constraints. Uh, so one, one for the, the first method of, uh, of minimally invasive fixation of those sacral fractures is the iliosacral screw fixation. It's actually a sacral screw, but it passes first uh, through the uh, both cortices of the part of the, ili uh, of the iliac bone, uh, which is um, uh, buttressing uh, the sacrum from behind then uh, passing in this void, then it is like a medially directed sacral screw. The problem with this screw is that it's very good for the patient, very bad for the surgeon. A lot of image intensification unless you have a navigation system. The other problem is that you cannot place it properly unless you have a perfect reduction of the fracture, which is not that, that very easy. Uh, another uh, way is to try to use iliac screws in the set of lumbo pelvic fixation. This is especially important if uh, if we have type two and type three of Isler classification, as uh, I just uh, mentioned, and it's uh, it's like that, so it's not that very much minimally invasive because uh, you can put these uh, screws percutaneous, also the iliac screw percutaneous, as I'm going to describe now, uh, but the connection is not that easy minimally invasive. Um, uh, the problem with lumbopelvic fixation, you cannot use it always. Uh, it's a restraint to the lumbar, that's the weight movement. Mm -hmm might cause early spondylosis and just a segment degeneration, especially uh, because keeping lordosis with those devices is very difficult. So we will keep them to its indications. Traditionally used uh, other method, um, uh, which were um, uh, methods that were traditionally used for, uh, for this kind of fixation is the plate fixation. The problem with the plate is not um, uh, only that it's not easy to be put in a minimally invasive way in a jubilized skin, but the, the effective uh, screws that are uh, one screw here, one screw on the other side that can be passed as pelvic uh, uh, iliac screws. And also you can put these screws uh, in that direction to be like sacral screws passing into the ala uh, of the sacrum and maybe the first sacral uh, uh, segment. Uh, but it's not easy to be put many, many invasive as well. Uh, um, again, I'm, I'm coming back to the sacral bars because I said that um, uh, they failed because they are completely posterior uh, to uh, the um, uh, pivot point. Um, the work that uh, I've done uh, beginning from 2009 and published in 2011 is that uh, to change these sacral bars into effective ones by attaching them to iliac screws. So now the whole construct is just embracing the pelvis and buttressing the sacral fractures. Uh, this is the uh, first two, two cases uh, that were published in World Spinal Colon Journal in 2011. Uh, this is the idea, iliac screws connected, uh, or two iliac screws on each side connected. Uh, these were the, 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 the very first cases where uh, our incisions uh, were, uh, were big. Uh, now it's just one centimeter incision for two screws. And in this very first case, it was open book. Uh, so I used uh, a small uh, symphysial plate and then uh, placed uh, this device from, uh, from the back. Um, uh, since it's very uh, many, many invasive and use a very small screw, uh, even in those uh, open book fractures, I can use a belt like this one, flip the patient up the reduction and use very small incisions to put two screws on each side with no need for symphysial plate. And this is an example uh, of such a case. 
can be used also with vertical shear. And this is an example of very good reduction where the, uh, the intact hemipelvis brings the uh, mobile hemipelvis uh, in a very good reduction, like uh, cases of spondylolysis. And this is even uh, uh, sacroiliac dislocation open book uh, with the use of belt as well. And this is the kind of reduction uh, that we were uh, able to achieve. Uh, this is not a very minimally invasive one. It's a fragmented uh, uh, fracture uh, of the sacrum that needed uh, direct uh, uh, decompression. Uh, and with uh, lumbopelvic and ilioalial fixation, uh, patient recovered uh, uh, neurological deficit. This was studied by mechanically in the United States in the University of Toledo, myself, Lisa Ferrara, and Andy Wakefield. Uh, and it's even uh, stronger than intact specimen. And we showed this in 2015 in San Diego in ISASS um, a meeting. And then uh, we were honored uh, by publishing 2018 in the World Neurosurgery, our longer term uh, follow up of our cases, um, uh, three years um, um, uh, follow up, 66% uh, uh, excellent final result Pullman score. 18% good final results and 16% fair results. Um, uh, the only problem with iliac screws is the prominence of the iliac screws at, uh, at, uh, at the iliac crest. So uh, instead of uh, using iliac screws, we can use S2 or iliac screws that can help also to be joystick to reduce um, uh, the displaced fractures like this one and then use them uh, for fixation. Also, if you use them with lumbopelvic fixation, it's more in alignment with uh, the other screws at the lumbar area. So we are using it more and more um, now. The other indication that we are using uh, this ilioilial fixation for is uh, for uh, fusion of uh, arthritic sacroiliac joints. Um, uh, these are the, um, uh, the devices, one of the devices that, uh, that, that is used now for minimally invasive fusion of the sacroiliac uh, joint. It needs navigation or uh, image intensification, but our device can work without all this. Uh, just fixing and compressing, it worked. Fixing, uh, uh, compressing, and do some decortication and grafting of the sacroiliac joint uh, in a many open way, or just compressing it and using bone marrow um, aspirate uh, as a, as a uh, adjunct for fusion. Uh, and we can use it also with S2 ailer iliac screws. It, moved, uh, it works very well, and uh, we're about to publish long term results. Thank you very much.